University, planetary geologist, planetary geologist. geologist. and also does things like looking at plants on Earth in space. I, I occasionally, I on dabble in Earth. Yeah. Well, she can tell us all about Venus. Mm -hmm. So, so welcome. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I uh, forgive me for not changing the title of this title slide for, for you guys, but this is a presentation I gave to American Zoo Natural History, which is where Dan saw me. And right. I much appreciate your invitation to come talk uh, to I'm you. I'm so glad you were here eighteen years ago. Though. I was here eighteen years ago. <laughs> wow. yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bob Meadows was still a young man then. <laughs> I was there and I confessed that he wasn't. <laughs> Were you talking about Venus back in the No, I was talking about Mars actually. Oh, okay. They work on both planets. Um, we sort of follow where the spacecraft data lead us. So um, so uh, so I am not an astronomer. Um, and I'm a geologist, so all of my telescopes point down. Um, instead of up, but I, I still care about photons, as you do, and, um, and in fact, I mean, the reason I do what I do is because as a child, I wanted to be an astronomer. I went to the, I grew up in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the State Museum has this beautiful planetarium, and I sat there and I thought, this is what I want to do, um, and I, uh, I, I actually, the same guy worked the planetarium I met him, I saw him again, I don't know, 30 years later, and I, uh, I got the opportunity to thank him for, you know, it was, it was awesome. <laughs> for uh, having me in this direction. Um, but then I took a geology class and I was like, okay, can I combine these things? And the combination is planetary geology, which is what I do. And so my, my, as a geologist, I look at morphology and spectroscopy of planetary surfaces. And um, I work on Earth, Mars, and <coughs> Venus. And um, Venus was the topic of my PhD dissertation and because when I got my PhD uh, in 1997, oh my god, um, it, uh, uh, Magellan, Magellan spacecraft had just arrived at Venus and shown us what this world was like. So that's the story I want to tell you. And um, Venus is special because it is an Earth-sized planet, and it is a planet that I will argue to you today was once habitable. And that's something we're going to try to find out. So this is a picture, if you to you all, right? I don't have to tell you what this picture is. <laughs> um, but when I talk to uh, public audiences uh, you know, about this, I, I like to just emphasize the fact that every image, every, almost everything you see here, as you know, is a galaxy. And if you think about, I don't know, hundreds of billions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars, and now we live in a time where we know that each star probably has planets, or that planetary formation is an intrinsic part of star formation. And the fact that I can take my two sons and say, you know, look, every one of those stars has planets around it is just unbelievable, right? We couldn't have done that, uh, you know, even 15 years ago almost. So. When we have, are struck by these statistics, then you know, we have all of these data, we have all of these uh, planets in the universe, and yet we only have confirmed life on one planet, which is here, which begs the question of where is everybody else, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so the place that I look and that we can look to answer that question is the place that's easiest to access, which is our own solar system. And when we, I, when I think about the solar system, this image, I love this image because this image, of course, is showing, it's not showing the distances correctly, but it's showing the rocky bodies of the solar system, and they are uh, to scale in terms of size with respect to each other. And that's an important part of the story that I'm going to tell you today, because the habitability of a planet is, uh, depends on the amount of energy a planet has. And the amount of heat and energy the planet has is a function of size. So we can all be proud to say that we live in a habitable solar system. 
um, where again, this is our one datum, uh, the Earth. Um, but I want to, the title of the slide is to remind me, to remind you, that we are, we, when we think of habitability, we, ha we can think of it, we also have to bring in the concept of time which is that you know, we're a 4.6 billion year old system. Uh, and so the habitability of our solar system today at 4.6 billion years is confined perhaps to, is confined to Earth and perhaps some of the, the moons of um, the large uh, planets. Um, maybe we'll know more about that in the next uh, couple decades. Um, but habitability changes with time. So to think about that question, I wanted to, um, when there are children in the audience, I asked them, sorry, I can't do the, I can't, oh, <laughs> where is my cursor? Oh. Um, I like to show this video um, just to remind us to think about what are the elements of a habitable planet. And so what are the ingredients that we need for habitable? Water. 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 Okay, what kind of water? Ah, so that means that we have to be within a, a strict temperature range. Salty water. What does it have to be? Ah, salty. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know how you get non-salty water. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, rain on atmosphere. You need an you need an atmosphere. That's right. You need an atmosphere. Energy or heat. You need heat. Solid surface. Well, <laughs> I don't know. What do the dolphins think? <laughs> That's an excellent question. There's a lot. I mean, just a little more water, and we would be a water world too. And so, I, as we discover these exoplanets, um, we need to. We can think about that as whether that it leads to habitability. But the things that you mentioned, right? It's water, uh, liquid water, atmosphere, and. Um, the maintenance of a temperature range over a time that's long <coughs> enough for life to develop. So when we define the habitable zone, we often think of it in terms of defining where around the star the temperatures are between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, right? And so this graphic is showing um, this, uh, the habitable zone of, sorry, it's fuzzy, but the habitable zone of the um, Earth's of, of the solar system. And again, it's trying to bring into this idea that the habitable zone changes with time. We start out with a dimmer star, and so that habitable zone is going to move back uh, and away from the star, or any star with time as it heats up and gets onto the main sequence. Um, but there are other factors here, and the, the factors that we have to think about um, is um, one of them is the atmosphere. And I love this picture for, because <clears throat> you're in the station and it's like, what's going on down there? Oh! <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> I mean, let me take out that, I mean, it's ridiculous. Look how beautiful this is. So this is a volcano on that Kamchatka Peninsula. So that's um, sort of if you follow the Aleutian Islands around the Pacific down to, um, down to Russia, those are all volcanic islands. And um, this is a prototypical, we call an arc volcano, a very ashy volcano like Mount St. Helens. So you can see the ash billowing out and some of it is falling down the sides of the volcano. And then we have this beautiful plume of ash that's rising up into the atmosphere. And then um, it's actually creating a cloud in, as the temperature is falling and you rise into um, the atmosphere and the it's also blowing out. <laughs> it's incredible. The heat is blowing out from the, the cloud that was there. It's just a gorgeous picture. But what is important here from a planetary perspective is that this plume of ash and the exhalations of all volcanoes are filled with water. And this is the primary mechanism by which we get water out of the interior of the Earth into the atmosphere of the Earth. And we don't think about this on Earth, really, because, oh, there's water in the atmosphere, there's water over there, where, and who cares if there's more water in this volcano? But if you don't have volcanism, you turn off the mechanism to bring volatiles and water out of the inside of the planet and maintain and feed the atmosphere. And so whether or not you have volcanism is critical to habitability. And that is a function of size. 
So here's a, another video, just a, I stole off the internet like 10 years ago, so it's hopeless, I don't know where it came from. Um, but this is showing a cross section of the earth and it's showing uh, the convection of the earth's mantle. So we know we have a hot planet, there are plumes of material coming off the core and hinging on the, the uh, lithosphere of the planet or the crust of the planet. And then we have plumes that are, of, uh, that are going down, that are cold down to the core mantle boundary. Um, but the reason we have a hot convecting planet is because we are large enough to have held on to our heat for four and a half billion years. Every planet starts out hot. The heat of accretion, the heat of radioactivity, um, the, the heat of core formation also is a, is, a big, is a big generator. And so you start out hot and then you cool off and um, I tell my students, you know, a baked potato cools off more slowly than a pea. <laughs> it's a matter of surface area to volume ratio. So small planets cool faster than large planets. And we are large enough to be warm at four and a half billion years. The moon and Mars have cooled <coughs> off. They had volcanism. The, the beautiful images you took of the mare the moon, those mare are three and a half billion years old. So that was the last time the moon was hot enough to generate volcanism. Mars lasted a little longer than that because it's a little bit larger. Um, and the Earth is still going strong. So without knowing anything about anything, <laughs> without you need one parameter, the radius of a planet tells you how much heat that planet has. If you know the age and you know the size, the components of the stars, as you know, except for those crazy C-type stars, those carbon stars, I mean, they're, you know, the metallicity is, is pretty similar across the, the, the galaxy, right, the universe. So we expect that the components of planets should be basically the same. And when you form the planets, you've got a, a certain amount of radioactive elements and the size will dictate how long you can stay warm. So without knowing anything else about the planets, Venus should have, uh, should be volcanically active without seeing the surface at all, right? It's the same size as the Earth and that's our expectation. So I put, I put to some, I did some PowerPoint action here. So you have to be large enough to stay geologically active um, long enough for life to develop. So Mars was hot in the beginning and it had oceans, um, but hopefully we'll find life on Mars. That would make, I'm sure everybody in this room really happy. <laughs> oh, it'd be a nice thing to think about. So I, I, just, I got crazy here. Too cold, too cold, definitely active, maybe, and then should be for Venus just as a consequence of its size. And then the other thing you need that size uh, factors into is you need to have enough gravity to hold on to the atmosphere that you make. So um, Mercury and the Moon are too small to hold on to atmospheres, they're airless bodies, so you know, Ceres and Vesta, same thing. Uh, the outer um, moons are also often, um, as you know, their habitable zones are confined to um, being underneath icy crusts. So there's, there's no, they're too small to hold onto an atmosphere. We have a one bar prominent, predominantly nitrogen atmosphere today, not, not always, but today. At the beginning, when the planets formed, each one of the planets had a CO2 atmosphere, which is what you <clears throat> predict if you just take the chemistry of the planets and you let it go. It starts out as CO2. We have altered the atmosphere. The first environmental catastrophe on Earth was the rise of photosynthesis, which oxygenated the atmosphere and, um, and changed the whole, the whole deal. <laughs> um, so we have a one bar. Uh, Mars still has a CO2 atmosphere but it's thin because it's small. And then Venus has this huge CO2 atmosphere. And the reason is, the short answer is, that on Earth, our carbon is mostly locked up in rocks, in uh, calcium carbonate, in limestones, reefs. If you took all of the 
reefs of the earth and all the limestones of the earth and you liberated all that CO2, you would have about 60 bars of CO2 liberated. So to do that, you need to have liquid water which facilitates the reaction to allow atmospheric CO2 to bind with calcium and magnesium and precipitate out as rock. So if you had an ocean, you can scrub the CO2. So when we now let's now consider these aspects of the planets and look at look at the habitability of the solar system back in time. So this is what I'm going to argue. Um, we have Earth is habitable. Now, this is considering the solar system at about a billion years, a billion years old. Um, so three and a half billion years ago. Um, and oh, I just want to do a shout out to the other like planet, all the other, I call them planets, but the other moons that um, may be habitable. Europa, Titan, isn't this wonderful? Enceladus, um, maybe Triton. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's fantastic out there. Um, we believe that Mars was, uh, we have ample evidence that Mars had liquid water on its surface. And I'm going to argue that Venus also had liquid water on its surface. And so the image um, I'd like you to go away with um, is what the solar system would have looked like to an alien who flew by three and a half billion years ago, which was a solar system with three terrestrial planets, all with oceans all of them with oceans, all of them habitable, at the same time that life was emerging on the Earth. Okay. That's what I think. This is what, this is where we're, this is what we're thinking now. And I'm going to try to um, convince you, or show you the evidence for this. Um, so, so Venus is an Earth-sized planet. This is an image from um, the Akatsuki orbiter, which is in orbit right now. And we want to know, was it habitable? We want to know how it differed from Earth um, and why it's different from Earth. And that's tied up in the history of water and then in the history of geologic activity, which is what I'll tell you about. And if you guys have questions, you can always ask. So, um, and what is the gravity of Venus? Is it it's, the same, it's almost the same as here. Okay. So it's 8.87. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So a little bit. Just a little bit. But under 90 bars of pressure. Yeah. Venus doesn't have the same iron core that Earth does. Earth has a larger than usual iron core because we were we got smacked up by something the size of Mars that deposited the iron core into Earth. Is, isn't that correct? Um, so Venus wouldn't have the same. I, I love that question. I love yeah. that question. So is it, firstly, it's confusingly bad question? No, it's incredibly interesting question because usual is hard to define because we don't actually know what the cores of Mars, Venus, or Venus are, and Mercury is unusual, right, in that it has such a large core, right. so, right, and then, um, so we haven't actually made that measurement yet, and then the other thing that's interesting about it is that Venus rotates backwards, and so something hit it, and there's no moon, there could have been a moon, so who knows? But something happened to Venus that changed its rotation, and that's a that's a big deal, as we can imagine. Okay. So, for you guys, and again, I'm sorry I didn't update this for today. <laughs> I just I, I polls will do on Friday. I'm sorry, I'm crazy. Uh, so, um, Venus, of course, is one of the most beautiful things in the sky, and. Um, uh, so when I gave this talk in February, Venus was in the uh, the morning sky. Some pictures of Venus, and um, Venus is also factored very prominently into um, human history. Uh, here's an observatory. It's just like your observatory. It's just a lot older. You had to be stoned to be in that. Oh, oh, oh man! So the Maya tracked Venus very carefully. Uh, it was very important to their uh, calendar system. And then I love this image because this is Galileo's drawings of um, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars at the top, 
and then the phases of Venus, which he, um, which were part of the argument against uh, the Earth being at the center of the solar of the, of the solar system. Um, and uh, this draw, it's incredible. Like, he drew it. He they drew this, and then, of course, today, this is what we see, that Venus, because it's an interior planet, an inferior planet, interior planet, it has phases like the moon, and when it's closer to us, it's bigger, uh, and it's new phase, and it's just, I'm sure all of you have seen this, but I, I like to tell people who haven't seen this, look at Venus. With those, I want to get those good binoculars to do. But. Right. That's all you want for it. Uh, yeah, yeah, to, to really see that properly. So, um, so we first visited Venus, um, uh, the U.S. first visited Venus in 1974. This is a Mariner 10 image, and when you go to Venus, the reason why it has this high albedo is because it's covered in clouds. And um, at the, as, so Mariner 10 was going by on its way to Mercury, and we have measured, we had measured from Earth-based assets that it's a dominantly CO2 atmosphere and that it is thick. And because it is so thick and heavy and it's CO2, it results in a surface temperature of 450 degrees Celsius. So that's why it's hard to do Venus. And that's why it's hard to sell Venus, because it's hard, you know, for Mars, we can see it all. For Venus, um, we need to well, we need a radar. Um, but despite this problem, the Soviets decided to go to Venus at every launch opportunity, starting in 1961. So the Venera spacecraft were a combination of, um, there's, an, there's an orbiter there with uh, some radar, and then in that big sphere was this lander, which um, is essentially a, a big doer with a um, with several instruments inside that can measure the chemistry of the surface and take imagery. Um, it landed on a big donut, and it has mm -hmm. this ring because the Venus atmosphere is so thick. It, it, it is it's a super critical fluid actually. So when the landers come in, you can drop a parachute, and the ring is enough to slow the descent, and it just lands on a little mm -hmm. donut. It's like it's like being underwater. It's, it's crazy, I mean, really hot water. <laughs> um, so, so the instruments inside, they had phase change, phase change material on the outside of this thing, and the instruments survived, uh, I think the longest lived uh, package was an hour and a half before succumbing to a thermal death. Yeah. So what you're saying is like the terminal velocity on Venus is really, really low? Yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's like being underwater. It's hard to, I, I, yeah. yeah. I don't under I don't have a good feeling for what a super critical fluid is like, you know what that means. It is, you know, but um, but yeah, you just float right down. <coughs> so the first this the Venera series. So the so it's interesting. The Soviets were like, we're going to do this, you know, every launch opportunity, which was every thirteen months, I think. So they just kept sending stuff. They didn't have any idea what the surface looked like. They built this thing to land on anything. And so many of them failed. They just keep, kept sending them, kept sending them. So the first human-made device to enter the atmosphere of a planet was 1967. The first landing on another planet was 1970. And the first images from planetary surface were in 1975, all from Venus. So the surface of Venus looks like this. Um, this is... Um, Venera 14, and uh, this image actually, so this guy, Don Mitchell, has a very interesting website. If you, you guys, well, if you guys want to geek out on imagery, when, the next time you feel like geeking out, okay, <laughs> visit his website because the, the cameras were actually, they looked toe to, to horizon, so they, the images were really distorted. And this guy took great pains to rectify the images so they look like what you would see on the surface, if you were standing on the surface. And they make, it makes them much more interpretable. Um, so this is, the, this is the lander itself. This, is, this arm is you know, like that long. And you can see, well, what can you see? What do you, what do you think about Venus? It's rock. I think it's flat. It's rock. Yeah? yeah? Looks like there was water. Is that a hill up there or a mountain? No, there's, there's a hill. 
Yeah, somebody yeah. said it looks like there's water. Why do you say that? Remember, it's 450 degrees Celsius, so there's no actual, there's no water today. But why would you? It's like a canyon. Like right? Yeah, it looks, right. So the, there's some meandering, right, there, it, it's layered. I mean, yeah. It actually reminds me more of like the area around a volcano. The it looks like slate on the flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like slate. Yeah. 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 yeah, but the little rocks are round. They I know. Get that way unless there's water around. Right. Well, I know. Or <laughs> 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 But couldn't a dense atmosphere act like water? Yeah, so it, it, the wind, the wind is like being in current. Yes. But there's a lot of carbon in that. Yeah, yeah. A lot more than we have. Oh yeah, yeah. So it could wear things like it's underwater. Uh, th these are open questions. Right. right. I just answered them. Well, <laughs> <laughs> because we have. Thanks, you know, Bob Blasco. We have a single pressure temperature, reliable pressure temperature profile for Venus under the clouds, period. We don't have very good wind speed information. So inter try to interpret the weather of the Earth from that data alone. Right. I, I hear you, but we don't know. <laughs> That's so. That's yeah, interesting. Please. So how about the, there's hydrochloric acid raining constantly? There's sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid. Yeah. There's, there's high, there so, is chlorine, but... I, I, yeah. Thank you for, saying, for taking my course and reminding me what the hell I'm supposed to say. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, that was one of the things as well, yes. It doesn't hit the ground. It's it's so it does hit the ground. It's it has some pure gas, it doesn't need water. Ah! <laughs> no, so the cloud, okay. The sulfuric acid in the cloud deck, which is about 55 kilometers up. It's hydrogen sulfide. It's, yes. It's, well, no, it's, it's H2SO4. Right, and then we don't know, and there's also water up there, but what they're measuring, what, how they're combining that chemistry is not well known. Pioneer Venus, Pioneer Venus, um, measured, which had a balloon, uh, measured one droplet of cloud because it had a mass spectrometer, it sucked in a cloud particle, and that cloud particle got stuck, and so it measured one drop of Venus, and so that chemistry is, yeah. But how could you make H2SO4 without having water? You do have water. It's just not a lot of water. In the clouds. In the clouds. This is at the surface. So that stuff rains yeah, out. Yeah. And then it's so hot, it just never makes it to the, the ground. Stays, stays. Right. I was just going to say, it boils before it hits the ground. Yes. Right? Yeah, it vaporizes. Yeah. But this is what we have for Venus. So, you know, unlike the other planets where we're able to do sort of reconnaissance and then, you know, land and then rove, this is what we have for Venus until, um, until Magellan, um, which I'll introduce to, to you in a second. But, um, but one of the things that the, the Soviets were able to do, oh, and by the way, the Soviets have never been able to successfully go to Mars. Every single, we talk about this, every single mission they've ever sent to Mars ever has failed. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> well, if they didn't trade Babe Ruth in 1910, it would never have happened. Uh oh. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. Uh, this is, yes. These are two different. Daenerys? No, this is the same. Uh, oh, this is the back and front okay. of the same place. Yeah. So um, if there's more soil, or I should say, regolith. Um, <coughs> technically, soil is organic. So this is re more regolith on one side than the other. They just left out where they landed. They could have landed on top of a mountain or a volcano or yeah. on the side yeah. of some. They may have because a lot of them failed. Yeah. Right. Also, only I think this is the only one that had cameras that had working cameras. The rest of the time, they either failed, or one of them I know the lens cap didn't pop off. Uh, yeah. So no, we have we have images from uh, nine, ten, thirteen, and fourteen. Any idea how the distance is to those whatever the hills or are they hills or just mounds or? Yeah. Right. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, so I, I bet Don's calculated it. I bet he has, actually. Um, but 
the data that we have, the imagery that I'll show you for, for Venus from orbit is 75 meters per pixel. So we can't, per pixel. We, we don't, yes. So we don't know where these are accurately on the surface of Venus. So Do you I know can't, roughly where they are at all or no? We know roughly, but it's like a huge error bar. So, yeah. so I can't give you an image that correlates to this right. in terms of knowledge of the spacecraft location nor the um, spatial resolution. How long did it transmit? It's melted. Yeah, hour. Yeah. An hour? Excuse me. Hour and a half. <laughs> it's interesting that the one on the right shows like a flat horizon. The other one yeah. is totally, you know, it's yeah. almost like it's a totally different horizon from yeah, the next, right? You know what I'm saying? I, I, you know, there, it, this could be 13 and 14 actually. Yeah. I know that one's fourteen because that's the smooth one. This actually you could be I don't saying, think they have that instrument on both on both on multiple sides. Yeah, the that's little arm thingy. Yeah, the arm thingy. Yeah, this is probably thirteen. And, 14. and those little spikes are yeah. identical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thirteen and fourteen. Thank you. My watch is thirteen. Yeah, thirteen and fourteen. So um, one. So from a geology perspective, though, what these guys me these guys were able to measure the chemistry of the um, surface, and that gives you a, con a ton of information. And I, I put this up, don't just, don't worry. I, I, put this, I put this up because I wanted to show you that we have chemistry from Denra, not eight, nine, 10, Vega and Vega, which is uranium, thorium, potassium. And then for three of these, we have what are called major elements. And this constituent, which is silicon, uh, silica oxide, SiO2, is part of how we define igneous rocks on Earth. And from these data, I can tell you that these rocks are basalt. And if you, so this is my little basalt montage. So basalts are important because the chemistry of the planets is the same. When you make the mantle of a planet and you melt it, you get basalt. Okay. Yeah. Isn't silicon dioxide quartz? Yes. Yeah. Right. But it, that's just without any, any other elements. Yeah. 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 So, um, so this is really telling because it, can, it tells you that there was volcanism, and it tells you um, where that volcanism comes from. So here's some examples of basalt. This is Hawaii last year when it was erupting away, um, mantles coming up, and beautiful basalt. Unless you live there, then you're sad. Um, <laughs> do you hear that woman? She's like, yeah, my house was getting hot, and that's because there's a river of lava running under her house. Oh my god, OK. Um, the Mare the Moon, the salt. Um, mercury, you can't, it doesn't have as much contrast. Lavas are still the salt. Uh, this is Olympus Mons on Mars, largest volcano solar system. Everything you're seeing here is basalt. Um, I was at the Museum of Natural History. This is a piece of Mars, Shrigati. We measure, we got it, a meteorite from Mars, measure it, it's the salt. <laughs> um, and then this I got excited. Um, and the uh, IO as well, you're melting the mantle of a silicate body, it's the salt. Okay. So why this is important is because it tells you you're directly melting the mantle, and if you have any deviation from that, that tells you a different story. And the punchline is that the Earth is the only planet that we have that has rocks that are not basaltic, that are granites because you need water to make granite, and that's part of the story that I'm going to continue to tell you about Venus. Sorry, I'm, 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 okay, I'm going to speak up. Yeah, so, I, I, you know, so, so you're identifying, and I am, <clears throat> one thing I know nothing about is geology, okay? So a salt is defined by you as having these particular perceptions yes. of these compounds. Is that? Particularly SiO2. Particularly SiO2. So the, those 45% numbers, yep. that's yep. by definition the salt. Oh, a granite, okay. you, uh, your, a granite is like 75% of okay. SiO2. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, um, so, how do we, oops, uh, what have we measured? So, we sent Magellan, uh, it was uh, <laughs> beautiful. There were two planetary missions in uh, the 80s. Both were launched from the shuttle, that was Galileo and Magellan. Uh, it's a radar mission, uh, one, it, <laughs> It was very ambitious at the beginning. They whittled it down to a single dish, which measured um, uh, synthetic aperture radar, altimetry, and emissivity. Um, and then, 
Emiss emissivity. So that is just the um, uh, passively measuring the photons from the surface. So, um, so meaning it, it's 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 just it just it because it's in radar weight at radar wavelengths. So it's twelve point six centimeters. It's just measuring um, the stuff that the photons that are at that can be detected at that wavelength. So it's way, it's not in the thermal, it's not in the visible, it's not in the thermal, it's way out in the radar. Um, and then it was, the ESA has sent Venus Express, um, and right now Akatsuki uh, is at Venus after <coughs> a trip in, around the sun because it missed Venus the first time, and now it's, it's a, an amazing story. So um, Magellan mapped the entire surface, and this is altimetry, this is topography. What's red is high, and what's in the greens is low. And so the Venera landers were landing in these low-lying areas, actually. Um, and what we, so this is about the same size as the Earth. So if you can sort of project you know, your Mercator image of the Earth here to kind of get a sense of the size of these things, we can roughly divide Venus into three types of terrains. Plains, the volcanic plains, which is what Venera landed on, is about 80% of the surface. We're going to assume, based on our morphology and the chemistry, that they're basaltic. We have large volcanoes, and then we have this weird stuff called tessera, which is really deformed stuff. And if you look at it in the actual imagery, you can see, this is radar, so rough, if it's bright, it's rough. If it's dark, it's smooth at the 12 centimeter scale. So these tessera are sort of rough and deformed. The plains are smoother. The rifts and volcanoes are variable depending on their um, degree of you know, the lava flow shapes and things like that. But we have a general stratigraphy, which is that any time you see these things in contact, the tessera are consistently older than the plains, and the rifts and volcanoes are a little bit younger than the plains. But this re relative relationship you know, we don't have the we don't have the ability to get a rock and date it, so we have to rely on the crater age to tell us something about how old a surface is. So, if you look at the craters on Venus, there's only about 900 of them, and by correlating that to the number of craters we have on the Moon, this is a lunar map just for comparison, we can estimate the surface age of Venus at about half a billion years. And the crazy thing about it is that the craters are on, they're, they're pristine-ish, I mean, and they're, they're, um, spatial, they're spatially random. So unlike the moon where you have areas where you have less craters, the Mare, which are younger, than the highlands, which have lots of craters, Venus is all the same age. So whatever happened to Venus 500 million years ago, which looks to be volcanic, happened all at once, and things have been kind of quiet since. It's crazy pants. So if you look at a if you look at a strategic strata on a column of the Earth, so I put it on its side. This is four and a half billion years ago. That's today. Here are all of our our little things that are our eras and eons that are basically based on the fossil record. Venus has one datum. That's it. The average crater age, 500 million years ago. We know something about what's happened since. We know almost nothing about what's happened before. But because of the stratigraphy, we can say that we can excuse me, address the two <coughs> questions I set out at the beginning. We can ask the question by looking at the, not the younger volcanoes, as seen as active today, and then we can ask the second question was, is there a history of water in, the, in Venus's uh, past, which would be recorded in those older rocks in the Tessera terrain? Pretty pictures of Venus. Let's look at the volcanoes. <coughs> There's a nice volcano over there, Kula Mons. Everything on Venus is named after a woman, except for the tallest mountain, it's named after a guy. <laughs> How tall would that mountain be? Um, <laughs> are we, are we Does it matter? Yeah. Yeah. Does it really matter? Yeah. Yeah. I think it was like 12 kilometers or something. It's <laughs> well, yeah. I, I actually tried to change it. I got a lot of resistance from people about it. Um, people were like, oh, well, it's always been this way. So that's a, that's a fight I'll have when my kids are not so young and I have more energy. Okay, um, so, so we're going to start a petition, right? Um, so this is, I'm, I'm sorry this graphic is so, is so complicated, but it, it summarizes everything nicely and, it's, and I'll lead you through it. The Venus Express spacecraft, which only measured atmospheric stuff, which mostly measure atmospheric stuff, made three observations in the, in the last uh, 
in the 2000s, the aughts, that have suggested that there's active volcanism on Venus today. And one of them, this is a plot of year, 1980, 2010. This is SO2 abundance at the top of the clouds, and it varies. And the reason this is interesting is because SO2 should not stay stable in the atmosphere for long. The rocks, it reacts with the rocks, the rocks uh, take it out. And so the fact that this is variable and that you have these peaks is suggesting that there's something that's inputting SO2 into the atmosphere on Earth that would be volcanism. Maybe that's volcanism here. Um, additionally, this is a... a what could it be besides volcanism? It can just be crazy atmospheric stuff that the atmosphere people talk about. I don't understand atmospheric physics, but there you can you can do it another you can do it another way. It's well, volcanism is the only good convenient explanation. Not according to the atmospheric scientists. So yeah, it, or they just don't like the idea of volcanism very much. No, we just have to make sure that we're saying the right thing. I mean, we, you know, so so it could be, but there is another way to explain it. Um, with other chemistry that I, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, on the same chart, is there no data from 1995 to 2005? Or, you know, there, I guess. I think there's no data. No data. Yeah, so this was um, so, yeah. Pioneer Venus, other spacecraft, and then this is the Venus Express spacecraft, oh. so there was nothing there. Um, we're not getting it from ground observations or anything from here. Not at this altitude. Um, Oh, yeah, 70 uh, kilometers. Sorry. Yeah, so um, 70 kilometers. And not at this resolution, I guess. Um, but uh, the other the other things they measured. This is these are examples of surface emissivity. So this is actually temperature, surface temperature. And what this is showing is the same piece of Venus in two on two days, two days apart, 22nd of June, 24th of June. The red corresponds to heat. And so on this day, it was one temperature, and on that day, it was hotter. And that also can be interpreted to be due to lava on the surface. Hotter to what factor? Hotter, so it is um, the temperature, so the temperature is going to, oh, why don't they have good scale bars here? Off the top of your head. No, 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 I, no, I have the data here, I'm just trying to, so, so this is 425, this is 485, so the bright, so it's brighter than 485. So it's it's pretty, um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it, it would have to be in the, like, a thousand degrees C for it to actually show up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and then this image is showing uh, a chemical reaction that is, it's just suggesting that it's not as weathered as other lava. Um, so, so, so there's some suggestions that Venus is active today, and, and that would allow us to um, consider that there is uh, energy to dry volcanism that has persisted throughout the four billion year history, which is what we would expect from the size. So, so that's exciting. Um, the other thing that we wanted to know is about the history of water. And um, this, again, is predicated on the idea that all of the planets are made out of the same stuff. This is an image you've all seen before, the Alma image of a planetary nebula. So imagine that Venus and Earth are forming in this nebula in the same basic neighborhood. They're sweeping up the same stuff. And this is a model of different planets. They, they made different planets. This is AU, so that's 1 AU, 1.5, 2. And these are just different runs of what stuff accretes out of a disk. And so basically it's showing that the proportions of stuff that's close to the star and stuff that's a little bit further from the star are similar in the neighborhood. So there's no reason to intrinsically think that Venus and Earth should have the same complement of volatiles, is our assumption. <coughs> And we know that Venus has lost a heck of a lot of water, and we've known this for a long time. So Kathleen de Berg, this is 1991, she made observations from Earth about deuterium on Venus. This is a complicated diagram, but basically at the top of the atmosphere, um, you know, nat what I call nasty rays, cosmic rays, high energy stuff, is hitting the atmosphere, it's breaking up molecules, hydrogen is lighter than deuterium, it leaves more easily. So the remaining deuterium is a record of the hydrogen that used to, 
it, it's hydrogen brethren, <laughs> right? right? Um, so the deuterium hydrogen ratio on Venus is huge, and you, if you back calculate that, that corresponds to a lot of water that's been lost from Venus over its history. So we uh, we argue about the how how much water or how long the ocean persisted, but the latest paper that's talked about this is model Venus is having an ocean for two to three billion years. Two to three billion years. So when we think about the habitability, the time where Venus was habitable, it's not just in its early stage like Mars, the early stages of planet formation like Mars, but it may have persisted for a long time. And this is the time over which life well, it started, life on Earth started very early, 4.8 or more, and kind of hung out, you know, photosynthesis happened. I mean, this, a lot of things could have happened on Venus that we might have a record for, if we can find it. Yeah. Uh, what, uh, if the water was on Venus, uh, if you're hypothesizing, what would the atmospheric composition have been at the time, do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. You would have sequestered a lot of carbon. So yes, yes. But if there if there are oceans, you would take out the carbon, and you would reduce the temperature. That's our assumption. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any speculation that the uh, event that you refer to that something hit Venus? I mean, I never knew that something apparently had hit Venus, but that might be uh, responsible for the sudden absence of water. Uh, there, uh, the Mars community. Um, Argues there are huge arguments about whether impacts contribute water or remove water, <laughs> right? Because the impactor itself is wet, so it's a, it's a huge it's a big question on planetary geology as to whether which is the dominant. I mean, we got hit and we have a ton of water, so yeah. Question. Better question. If um, the sorry, I didn't mean to say that. That was just a um, mm -hmm. if you um. No, I'm sure what I was thinking. Oh, the, what kind of effect would an impactor have on the volcanism? Couldn't it change um, something, some of the properties of that? Sorry, I sound stupid now. No, 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 no. I, I mean, the impact that hit the Earth was so catastrophic that it basically reset everything. I mean, it destroyed. You would have had a magma ocean on the Earth after that. So you have to remake the crust. You have to remake the lithosphere, which is the stiff part of the crust. And start the whole thing going again. So it's it's so much energy. You just you start you start again. But if you hit it, could you if you hit it with less energy, what does it do? I don't know. You got to model it. Yeah, if you do a glancing blow. Depends on the size of the object and the speed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah please. I'll show you pretty pictures while you're asking questions. So pictures. <laughs> You've mentioned okay. several times that water takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It's a water. chemical process or a process that requires life? That's an excellent question. Life does it much more efficiently than, um, much most efficiently, but it, it definitely happens without life. You can make these minerals in the absence of life. But on Earth, most of the sequestration is due to corals, you know, and animals making shells today. Yeah. But we have carbonates on Mars, for example. Um, so, in fact, here's some carbonate on Mars right here. Um, so, so what we would like to do to look, what we do at Mars to find to find water is we look at the oldest rocks. And we try to say something about their composition. So this is an image of Mars. I'm switching to Mars for a second. This is what we wish we could do on Venus. We didn't have an atmosphere. We could do this on Venus. Um, this is a delta, a river delta, that's um, coming out into an impact crater that was a lake. This is the landing site for the Mars 2020 rover. So this is going to be an exciting place to go. And all of these colors are from a spectrometer in orbit that where it takes data that look like that. So that's in the that's in the near infrared, one micron to 2.6 micron. And those squiggles correspond to uh, vibrations in the mineral lattice. So from the squiggle, we can tell what the minerals are. And then we can make these beautiful maps and say, oh, the green is carbonate, and red is clay, and 
all these great things are happening on Mars. So for Venus, unfortunately, well, on Venus, we know where the oldest rocks are. At the resolution we have for Magellan, we don't see all rivers and things like we see on Mars at higher resolution. Remember, one pixel here is a football field. So we don't have the ability to see what we can see on Mars. Um, but we can do a little spectroscopy through one window, one window in the Venus atmosphere. And Venus Express did this. So this is one micron to 1.3 microns. This is radiance. And what it's showing is that at one micron, this red curve is showing, this is the amount of, of photons that make it from the bottom up to the, up to the top. And 96% of the photons at one micron that arrive at, in orbit are coming from the surface. And so we, we're going to use this one band as, as much as we can. And if you map the, the surface of Venus, this is the southern pole of Venus, um, what you can see is that there are variations in the one micron signal over, very, over different parts of the surface, where you have places where it's very bright, red, places where it's very dark. And the dark part corresponds to the oldest parts on Venus. So my work has been to try to suck the life out of that one, that one wavelength <laughs> by mapping. You know, it's like, um, this is the only big piece of tesser we have that was imaged. The, this is blue. The planes, which we know are basalt, are red. And I can plot, these are data from my lab, what different minerals look like at this wavelength. So at 1.02 micron, that's the line there. These are minerals that are uh, in granite. These are minerals that are in basalt. And this is to show that whatever this stuff is, it's closer to granite than it is to basalt. It's different from the plains. And so my contention has been, and what my work has been about, is to say that the tessera, these old rocks on Venus, are actually granitic. And to make granites, you have to have water. So this is one of my favorite titles of a paper. It's called No Water, No Granites, No Oceans, No Continents. To make granite, you have to have subducting plates, taking water-rich materials down, depressing the melting temperature of the mantle. That's what allows volcanism to change from basalt, which is what you get when you just melt the mantle directly, into something with higher silica content. So we're grasping at str not straws. We're grasping at photons here, right? A couple of photons are telling us, a couple of measurements that Venus is geologically active today. A couple of photons are suggesting that Venus had water uh, rocks that are from a time when Venus was, uh, had liquid water. And this is summarized here, um, where we can look at a, another stratigraphic column of planet formation four, that's four billion years ago. This is today. So this came out in Scientific American uh, this year. This is Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. What's red is showing the length of time that tectonic activity occurred uh, in volcanic activity. So Mercury is small, short time. Mars is larger, sort of petered out later. And Venus and Earth, Earth we know happens, volcanism persists today. And now we think that Venus pers persists today. <coughs> And on top of that, we have now a better sense of the time of liquid water on the surface of Venus. Liquid water has been on Earth almost since the beginning. We can constrain very well the evidence of liquid water on Mars, abundant liquid water, not just little you know, sniffles of water, which is back about four billion years ago. But Venus sh should have had, it's based on what we see in the models and the rocks, water persisting perhaps until a billion years ago. So this green thing is conditions favorable to DNA-based life. I don't know. That's the astrobiologist that wrote that. I'm not sure about that line. But I just want to, get, to give you the sense that if we really want to understand an Earth-like planet, and we really want to understand a planet that was habitable for longer than Mars, <laughs> Venus is, is that planet. So is that a question? So you can predict when we're going to lose the water? Um, yeah, it depends on how quickly we heat up our ass. <laughs> <laughs> Later. Mañana. When Venus was habitable, mm -hmm. it, 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 well, 
the atmospheric pressure wasn't what it is today, right? Is that right. correct? Exactly. We're making this assumption that the system would have worked like the Earth and the CO2 would have been sequestered. <coughs> yeah. So while we're thinking about habitability of Venus. Yeah. Yeah. No magnetic field. Today. Okay. I'm listening. So a possibility of a magnetic field earlier. Yeah. There. So what do you need for a magnetic field? Shielding. What? That's why you need it. No, I, I, I jumped to why you need it. Yeah. Why you need it is because you're closer to the sun and you've got that much more radiation to deal with. Right. But, to protect against the nasty rays. Sure. Yeah. Um, By need low, a, I assume, is what you need to create one. You right. need a convecting liquid outer core. Right? Yeah. So the reason why Venus's core may not convect, actually, is because... Um, because of the <laughs> because of the Rayleigh number, to get boil, to get convection, you need to have a hot bottom and a cold top, right? Yep. So Venus hasn't had volcanism in a while, and we think that I mean it has a little bit here and there, but the lithosphere is basically what we call a stagnant lid. It's the same. It's just so if you're not moving the top of the lithosphere, the mantle is going to heat up. So we think the reason why Venus doesn't have magnetic field today is because there is no temperature difference. The mantle is so hot, there's no delta T between the lower and upper uh, core, and so it's not conducting. Now, if you, whatever happened to Venus 500 million years ago, that whole sucker resurfaced. I bet you 10 bucks Venus had a magnetic field 500 million years ago. I'll bet you. Yeah, okay. it, it can, you can go in and out of that. It's not a, it's not a linear, you know, a, a, it doesn't have to go in one direction. I mean, what about the timing of this impact? Is that something you're factoring into that? We have no idea when that impact would happen. We have no yeah. earthly idea. If it was, it could have been earlier than the moon. Well, that's awesome. What evidence do you have that there was not only that it rotates backwards, and the only mechanism you have to do that is impacts. But I mean, is there any evidence anywhere else in the solar system of where you can point to that same thing and say that also is a result? Of Pluto? Uh, I don't know how Pluto, Pluto doesn't spin backwards, yeah. it's just been tilted Your, away. Uranus it spins rotates backwards. Everything else. It does spin backwards? No, it spins this way. Spins this way. Yeah. Uranus spins backwards. backwards. Pluto's yeah, tilted like awesome. Uranus too, actually. <laughs> What have the next missions been? Is there any mission no, planned? There are, um, yes, yes. <laughs> um, let me get back to that in a second. I just have a couple more slides. I, I, I realize the time, but your questions are so good. Um, okay, I have to throw this out here, although I have to throw this out here. So there was a paper published last year about whether or not Venus can be habitable today. <laughs> And this is an idea, so this paper was a paper, Lemaitre, 2018, but this is an idea that Morowitz and Sagan wrote about in 1967, Life in the Clouds of Venus, because if you look at the temperature, okay, so this is 70 kilometers, it's 45 degrees C, about, here's a bar, it's 60 degrees C, I and mean, this is shirt sleeve weather here, right? So. So in this paper, in that paper, they're making the assertion that you've got the chemistry you need for bacteria to eat. And on Earth, we do have bacteria that are in the clouds. But the caveat is that all of the Earth bacteria that live in the clouds come from the surface. They didn't originate there. They were elutriated there, and they hang out for a while and survive. And, and then they eventually back, drop back down. So. I don't know. Um, it's it's an interesting idea. Um, so uh, so maybe, and this may explain one of the great unknowns about Venus, which is actually you mentioned the clouds of Venus, the dark clouds of Venus. Where so, the little dark markings? That is absorbing. It's a UV image. They absorb in. The, there's something that absorbs in the UV, and nobody knows what it is. And it turns out that if you take bacteria. This is, I know, this is, this is not really happening. <laughs> if you take some bacteria, this is what my son did, and you measure the spectra of them, some of them absorb in the UV. Oh, I hate to even say it, because it's like, 
so many assumptions in a row that may amount to nothing. But um, but I do like it. It's, it's the Lando Calrissian, you know, idea. Right? It's, like, it's like yeah, uh, we we can we can hang out in Venus's atmosphere. Okay, I, I swear I have just a couple more slides. I'm sorry, it's so, so exciting. So this is, here's the other deal, right? I mean, is, it, is there not a better image than this? This is what, I mean, come on. Oh, can you believe that we get to see this unfold? It's just, it boggles my mind. So we have Earth-sized planets <coughs> up the wazoo, and because, as you know, the way we detect exoplanets with transits that means that we detect things that are close. And if we make a plot of um, distance versus, these are different star temperatures, this is a plot of um, a sampling of uh, planets that have been found, um, you know, and, and where they are, and the, the Earth-sized planets. And they're not at one AU, they're, they're <coughs> closer, right? So, Steve Kane, my, my, uh, my buddy Steve Kane, it, he defines what he calls a Venus zone, that most of the exoplanet, Earth-sized exoplanets that we've discovered so far are not in Earth, the Earth habitable zone, they're in the Venus zone, which makes it even more important for us to understand if we're going to have spectra from these planets soon, which we should, hopefully, um, how do we interpret it? Um, and this is just a pretty picture of Venus that I like. I don't know, I just like, I always like this image. This is topography. Isn't that cool? It's just pretty. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just have to think about it. Oh. Okay, so to get at your exploration question, and I swear I'm almost done. This is a. Uh, this is. I have uh, just uh, two more slides. This is an image uh, that uh, the associate administrator of NASA, Thomas Zerbukin, likes to show of the operating science fleet. It's um, outdated, though. What? It's outdated. Cassini's gone. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I, this I stole it. Um, but he showed this. He showed this uh, when I last I saw it you know, last year. But it's still incredible. What, what I like about this, it's just cool. I mean, look how many things we have around the sun. Did you have any idea we all these spacecraft around the sun? Mm -hmm. No clue. Look at all that. And then so there are Hubble's up there. So the the big telescopes are up here. The Earth stuff's over here. Um, Mars, Juno, Cassini, Voyagers, and Voyagers. I Voyager. Yeah. But look, look, oh, so terrible, so bad. <laughs> I forgot planet. Nothing. So, um, so Mercury had, um, Mercury actually, I mean, Messenger had just, I mean, it had just been there. And Bethy Columbo's on the way, even though that's not a NASA mission, but okay. Um, so, I made this chart because I'm, it's one of my jobs as a Venus advocate. Um, so this, this is the plot of missions that have been to Venus since Magellan. So this is the US missions on top, the international missions on the bottom. And I'm trying, because I'm trying to convince people to, that we need to go to Venus. So it's been 40 years since the US has been to Venus. 40 years, okay? And that's one of the reasons our Venus community is kind of small, is because we just haven't had data to deal with, especially geologists, because this stuff is great, but it's all atmosphere stuff. And the atmosphere people, I mean, they just they, they think about it in a different way. So, so what we have several pro, we have several programs that are we're called PI-led programs, where somebody can propose a mission to NASA, and we have done well in the last couple rounds, but we have not been selected. So for the small, we had two Venus missions selected for further study out of five, uh, five, five, it's like Monty Python, one, two, five. <laughs> <laughs> I, I finally got to show my kids the Holy Grail, so it was such a great weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so great. Um, right, anyway, uh, <laughs> so, um, there were five missions selected for further study, two were Venus missions, and in the end they picked the other three missions, all which are going to asteroids. Because asteroids are cheap, it's easy, right? And somehow, I mean the PI, one of them, Lindy Elkin Stanton, she's, uh, I, I, she's amazing, she was able to convince people that we need to go to a metal asteroid. A metal asteroid. Why do we need to go to a metal asteroid? There's probably eight times, sorry. <laughs> There's probably like iron meteorites all over the place. But she, she convinced, I mean, good for her. But um, 
So, so we haven't been selected for Venus yet. The, the last uh, round of medium class missions, Venus got, it was listed category one, which means it's selectable, and they selected two other missions, a, a Titan mission and a common sample return. So we're trying again. Those proposals are due in a couple months from now. I'm on two of them. We've been working our butts off to try to get um, those missions going. And then I'm also working on the next decade, which is a flagship billion dollar class mission to Venus um, to try to. We can send a Tesla to the sun, but we can't send it.